Thank you, my name's Hannah Miller. I am here at CU working with Alexis Templeton. So we've already talked about serpentinization a little bit, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail to the actual um, geochemical reaction right here. So serpentinization is a water rock reaction in which you get the oxidation of mantle rocks and minerals, such as olivine, which I show in this equation. So olivine has this iron two in it. When it reacts with water in an anoxic environment, it generates magnesium bearing minerals, such as serpentine and brucite, along with um, oxidized minerals like magnetite here and hydrogen gas. And this reaction has been very well studied at high temperatures, at hydrothermal vents or spreading, ocean, or spreading ridges under the ocean, but it hasn't been well characterized at low temperatures, temperatures that are under 120 degrees Celsius, where life can actually be actively harnessing that hydrogen being generated from these reactions. This is an image of what a partially serpentinized rock looks like. So you can see why it's called serpentine, because it generates these veins that look kind of snake-like. So what well, we always talk about, how does this relate back to astrobiology? Both, uh, well, Mars, we definitely know, has olivine, mineral, olivine minerals on it, as well as serpentine minerals. So there's potential that these water rock reactions could be occurring on Mars, making hydrogen gas, which is an electron donor for organisms to be utilizing. Additionally, Europa might also contain some of these um, mantle rocks, some of these iron-bearing rocks that could be serpentinizing. And also studies have been done on Enceladus and how there might be high pH fluids there that indicate serpentinization is occurring. So there are several metabolisms that could be supported by these water rock reactions. One that is oftentimes invoked is methanogenesis, because if you have all this hydrogen around, if, you, if there's some carbon available, you can make methane gas. And methane is a prevalent gas to be found in these serpentinizing environments. Its source is oftentimes debated. It may be biotic, abiotic, a mixture of the two. But it's definitely a relevant gas along with hydrogen in these environments. Additionally, we know we have, all, we have this electron donor, hydrogen around, but you need electron acceptors too for organisms. Oftentimes, nitrate and sulfate are found in these environments, so you can also have various metabolisms that utilize those. Um, one potential exciting metabolism would be anaerobic methane oxidation occurring in these environments. So you can see that serpentinization can fuel a variety of life. And that's kind of the theme of the Rock Powered Life NASA Astrobiology Institute, which Alexis Templeton heads up here at CU. So we are really investigating this, and a lot of different people at the conference have been talking about various things that RPL is working on. So I'm specifically working in Oman, which is located right here on the eastern edge of the Arabian Peninsula. And Oman is a great place to study serpentinization because it's the world's largest and best exposed ophiolite sequence. And for you non-geologists out there, an ophiolite sequence contains layers of upper mantle. So if you think about the Earth as an avocado, um, you have your mantle right here. So an ophiolite would be this upper mantle, which is the green fleshy part of the avocado, which is actually very appropriate because peridotite is a beautiful green color because of all this reduced iron. And then you have um, layered gabbros and pillow basalts on top. But I'm really interested in this peridotite right here in Oman. And the ophiolite was originally um, at a spreading ridge on the ocean floor, so it's already partially altered by the time we study it in Oman. It's already partially serpentinized. Some of that iron has already been oxidized. Um, so I've, I work on water rock reactions to actually characterize how hydrogen is being produced in these low temperature reactions. So first of all, we take some rock from Oman. You can see it has a beautiful oxidized weathering rind on the outside. We cut that off because we're just interested in looking at this um, relatively unoxidized iron. And then we go through this arduous process of grinding it up into really small pieces so there's higher surface area and these reactions actually proceed on the level of a PhD time scale. And, um, and we place all that ground up rock into these anaerobic vials we add some water of various compositions, some that simulate seawater or simulate the groundwater in the area. And then we purge the headspace with a nitrogen and CO2 gas mi mixture so that there's no oxygen in there and these, the iron can oxidize without oxygen around. And the results we see, so I did these reactions with this partially serpentinized rock from Oman at 100 degrees Celsius. 
And this is showing hydrogen production right here. The two different colors indicate um, the rock was reacting with two different Sea water, with two different water compositions. I'm not really going to go into that, but you get different hydrogen production based off of the media composition you're reacting the rock with. But you can see that we generate hydrogen up to about 500 nanomoles per gram of mineral reacted, which is actually quite significant for a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. It's one of the highest, rate, uh, highest concentrations reported in the literature. And it's also important to note that it's sustained hydrogen production. It doesn't make hydrogen for one day and then just stop. It's actually sustained, so there's a chance a microbe could actually be using that hydrogen over time. Additionally, we look at the aqueous chemistry during these reactions, and we can see that there's an increase in pH to about pH 9 after just 24 hours of reaction. And that aligns with what you see in serpentinizing environments. They have high pHs. Usually, they go up to pH 11. Um, so we don't see that in the time scale of our reactions, but it's probably just because this low temperature reaction isn't actually in equilibrium right now. Additionally, we see the loss of magnesium, iron, and manganese ions initially during the reaction. So there must be some mineral phase that's dissolving. And we add CO2 to the headspace, as I noted. That also gets drawn down pretty immediately. And when we see that CO2 get drawn down, we also see a formation of formate and acetate, um, these, acid, these simple organic acids. You can see just what their formulas are right here. But this likely forms through this reaction right here. You have hydrogen combining with some of that CO2 that's dissolved in the fluid to make formate. The fact that we have acetate is a little bit interesting and enigmatic because it's a lot more complicated to form acetate than formate. But this is still an interesting result that we found through these water rock reactions. Additionally, we also really want to characterize the mineralogy during these water rock reactions to see how the iron is actually oxidizing and what are the different reservoirs of iron in the system. So first, this is a picture of a thin section from Raman microscopy. And these yellow blobs here are olivine, and then the light blue in the background is all serpentine, and this is just a big like chromite diopside thing. But we can see that before this rock, rock reacts, we have serpentine. So this rock is already reacted. We can see it's a partially serpentinized rock. But when we look at the serpentine right here, this is the fingerprint region in Raman. So these are the characteristic serpentine peaks. But when we look at the OH, the, OH, the OH stretch of the serpentine, we see this bump right here that corresponds to brucite. So we can see that brucite is intimately intermixed with this serpentine. And based off of the peak of this brucite, um, we've calibrated how much iron is present in the brucite. So we can see there's 15 weight percent iron present. And that's important because this could be an important source of iron that could be oxidizing and leading to hydrogen generation. So when we look at the, the grains that have reacted and formed hydrogen, this, these are some powder XOD spectrum, spectra. And you can see that right here, red, is the unreacted rock. And there's a bunch of olivine and serpentine peaks. But the peak I'm going to focus on is this one right here. This black bump right here is brucite. So you can see in the unreacted rock, there's a fair amount of brucite. But then when we, act, when we react the rock with various medias, we can see that that brucite peak disappears. So brucite is being consumed during these water rock reactions. And that's likely why we saw that release of magnesium, manganese, and iron in the aqueous chemistry. And we also know this brucite contains iron. So that's a very likely source of the iron, too, that's then leading to hydrogen generation as it gets oxidized. Additionally, we've seen um, these are some images of just the thin sections of the rock before and after reaction. So you can see all these little splotches of mineral that are forming. There's definitely serpentine formation during these reactions. It's very amorphous and white, and there's not that much of it. But that is important because we know from that initial reaction I showed you, serpentine should be forming. At these high temperatures, we know it definitely does, but it also does at low temperatures. Additionally, we use magnetic susceptibility methods to show that magnetite forms. And that's also important to note because at these high temperatures, magnetite is thermodynamically expected to form. But at lower temperatures, it hasn't been observed as much. But we definitely see that magnetite is forming. And likely, that's what's accommodating this iron-3 formation. Okay. So overall, why we think we want to propose some sort of reaction for this low temperature serpentinization. And we believe that the dissolution of iron-2-bearing brucite is leading to hydrogen generation at these low temperatures. 
So because this rock was already partially serpentinized, there are some thoughts, well, is it even still reacted? Is it reactive? Is there still iron two available for oxidation? And yes, there is. And we think a lot of that iron two is coming out of brucite. Additionally, these reactions can make up to 37 nanomoles of hydrogen. So this is the hydrogen that's dissolved in the fluid, the hydrogen that's more biologically available. And that's more than enough to support some sort of microorganism because methanogens require much lower levels than that. Additionally, these reactions make reduced energy sources such as formate and acetate, which can support, support fermenters living in the, um, living in the subsurface. Um, so overall, that's how we think that low temperature hydrogen generation is happening in Oman. Of course, it's very site specific because these minerals had a lot of brucite in them. Um, I would like to thank everyone in my lab and our collaborators, and I would like to take any questions. Questions for Hannah? I was just curious what the average ratio of serpentinite to peridotite that you had for your samples. It started off as about 50% serpentine and 50% um, olivine. Was that your question, like the mineral yeah. portions? And during the reaction, it barely changes. <laughs> so just a little bit of brucite. We think it's about 5% by mass brucite reacted to generate the hydrogen we saw. Any other questions? Great. Let's thank Hannah one more time. Yeah.